So, like I said, um, I'm not going to put Metropolis in here, although Metropolis is worth watching. That was the first real film, and hey, what do you know? It talked about the future. It looks a lot like right now what they show in Metropolis, or at least what they figured it would look like today. Take a sip here. So, likewise, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go so in your face as to point out things like 1984 and all that. But I did put in as number one on my list 1984 Animal Farm slash Brave New World. There's several different versions of those films, or you know, those are books, but. There's several different film adaptations of those. I haven't really found one that I like of any of them. Um, the books are great. You really need to read 1984 by George Orwell. You really need to read Animal Farm in particular by George Orwell. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Is that... Black Lives Matters uh, slogan, or was that in Animal Farm? Read the book and find out. Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. I'm not a fan of Aldous Huxley personally. I think he was a little bit loopy. Uh, I believe, I'm not positive, but I think he was kind of a junkie too. Um, Brave New World does not impress me as much as Orwell's work. Um, I might even put a clip from Orwell speaking in, in somewhere in here. Um, where he explains very briefly the essence of his two books. But look for a film adaptation of 1984 or Animal Farm or Brave New World or any combination or all three. I just, I'm not going to lead you toward any particular one because I haven't found one that's been made that well yet. That's number one on my list then, is just to get those out of the way. The rest of these films are not going to be so overtly dystopic, or at least, you know, not in that sense. Alright, so let's move on to film number two. A Hard Day's Night by The Beatles. 1964. This was at the height of Beatlemania. Around the time that The Beatles went on Ed Sullivan's show, uh, which really helped the nation, or at least, you know, they're from England, but it really helped Americans to recover in a way from the Kennedy assassination and the horrible tragedy of that. Um, why would I put A Hard Day's Night on a list like this? It's just a goofy movie of four young lads running around having a great time singing beautiful songs and getting chased around by girls. Well, the reason is because it's a very good documentation of real-world mass hysteria. The whole point of A Hard Day's Night is, if you haven't seen it, it's the, it's, it's the Beatles basically going about their daily business, you know, putting on these shows, going to TV studios and playing and putting on shows, doing interviews with the media, but they're doing it and they're all kind of compartmentalized because they have to, they can't, they're not free to walk out in the world anymore because there's millions of girls out there just screaming their lungs out until they pass out from exhaustion. That's called mass hysteria. There's no earthly reason why all these girls around the world should be screaming because there's four guys, oh, I don't know, a hundred yards away at the other end of the stadium playing instruments that you can't even hear because everybody's screaming, and you're sitting there screaming your, your lungs out until you pass out. That's called mass hysteria. And it's only one example of where we've seen it in our species. But I can give you some other examples if you like. How about the Salem Witch Trials? How about the War of the Worlds broadcast with Orson Welles? How about um, the coronavirus health scare? Now do you see why I ask you to watch A Hard Day's Night? You need to understand that mass hysteria is real. And if you're participating in mass hysteria, you need to pull yourself out of it because you have become part of the problem. Now this one was relatively benign because it was just a bunch of girls going gaga over a couple of guys. But again, the reality of the situation is that those girls were never even going to meet these four guys, let alone get married to them. Why are they going berserk and crazy 
over four guys they've never met before. There were a lot of other really good bands at the same time. Some of them had guys in them who probably would be considered better looking than the Beatles. So why were the Beatles the ones? It's because it was a manufactured mass hysteria. And that's what we've seen. There are many examples. Um, mass hysteria has increasingly become something that is not natural anymore, like the Salem Witch Trials, but it's, been, it's being manufactured. See, you had the Salem Witch Trials, you had things like that all the time, mass, episodes of mass hysteria, pockets here and there in communities or larger groups. Then you had the War of the Worlds broadcast where it was an accident. They didn't mean to cause it, but it caused it. And people who want to dominate and control others thought, hmm, hmm, interesting. we got to study how this happened because if we can control that, we can cause mass hysteria wherever and whenever we want to, to our advantage. And, hey, what do you know, that's exactly what happened. You know, for example, in Germany, they went from the Jews being just ordinary citizens who were, in many ways, the most responsible for Germans' incredible prosperity and technological advancement. And within just a few years, a few years, they were so hated that Hitler could carry out a holocaust and nobody really raised a finger about it. Um, or if you prefer the exact same thing, uh, not, not the exact same outcome, but the exact same kind of reversal of thinking of people as perfectly normal in society to thinking that they are the most dangerous thing in the world and they need to be stopped at all costs, smokers. I talk about the anti-smoking industry in here all the time. They created a mass hysteria, such that now if you're out there and you watch someone smoking a cigarette, someone walks by maybe holding their kid's hand and they're walking 10, 20 feet away, and they go like, ew, get away, get away from that, I don't want you to get it hurt. And it's like, well, what about the 500 years that people were sitting there just <laughs> right in the same room with their kids, and hey, nothing happened except civilization advanced more than it ever had in all of human history. See, it's called mass hysteria, and that one was deliberately created. And they learned a lot when they taught people how to hate and fear smokers and to hate and fear the tobacco industry. They learned about a lot about how to create a health scare in order to take control over other people's lives and to take their money away. A Hard Day's Night by the Beatles. A real world example that you can watch with your own eyes of what mass hysteria looks like. Just in case you don't want to look at another example of mass hysteria because it makes you uncomfortable to do so. Number three. This is actually a pair of films. The first one is Airplane. The comedy, yeah, the comedy, airplane, you know, like, I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. Airplane. Many people do not know that Airplane was actually a remake of another film. Did you know that? It was an almost verbatim remake of another film. The film was called Zero Hour, and I think it came out, I don't know, maybe 1950 eight or so something like that zero hour was in it you can, so I'm urging you to watch zero hour first um, you can find it on YouTube I think it's only a bit more than an hour long it's a drama a very dark morose drama about an airplane where the pilots get sick from everyone gets food poisoning and there's nobody to fly the plane the words in the movie Airplane are almost verbatim taken from the script of Zero Hour. And yet, Zero Hour is this dark, morose drama, and Airplane is one of the funniest films ever made. Now the question is, how can that be? There, it's, it's essentially the same thing. One's in black and white, one's in color, and yeah, you've got the slapstick added in Airplane, you know, <laughs> we're on instruments and you see all the do, 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 you know that kind of thing but in terms of the script what they're speaking literally it's it's the same script it was a remake in fact zero hour had a, a explanation ex, 
exclamation point at the end of it, just like the movie Airplane. Now here's the significance of this. The reason I want you to watch Zero Hour... I can't talk all of a sudden. The reason I want you to watch Zero Hour and then watch Airplane again, because I'm sure you've seen it, is this. It is possible to take the exact same story, yay, even the same words, and to present them in two different manners that have completely different impact on you, on what you feel, on what you think, on what you believe, on your attitude, maybe even on your actions. The same story, literally. You can tell it in two completely different ways. And if you haven't figured it out yet, people who want to manipulate you can use that to, your, to their advantage. So I highly urge you to watch that and to carefully consider when you're done. Ask yourself, why is Airplane so funny and Zero Hour is such a downer? Zero Hour makes you want to walk out on an airplane, as Thurston Howell III once said, just to get away from it. It's so dark and morose. Why is one story so upbeat and happy and just makes you feel wonderful and the other one just makes you feel, oh, God. You know, the thing is, any story out there, oh, I don't know, let's just for an example, how about the story of President Donald Trump? One person could tell the story from a standpoint of reality and what actually exists in the real world. You know, the truth, things like that. And when you hear that, you, you're like, wow, that's really cool. That's good, and you feel happy, and you feel good, and you know, if there's 80 million or so of you who feel that way, you'll go out and vote for him. But then, if there's people who want to manipulate you, and they take the exact same story, but they tell it to you in a different way, you can sit there and devote your entire life to getting rid of Donald Trump, even if the consequences of doing so will destroy your nation and ruin your children's and grandchildren's entire existence. Zero hour and aeroplane. That's the second film. I'm sorry, that is the third film on my list. Let's move on to number four, which is All Quiet on the Western Front. All Quiet on the Western Front was from 1930. Very early film. So it's obviously one of the first full length feature film types out there. This movie is about World War I, which at the time they called the Great War, the war to end all wars, which it didn't. <laughs> Remember, at the time, these people had no conception of Adolf Hitler or Nazis or the Second World War or a Holocaust. They had no conception of nuclear weapons. This was a war that destroyed an entire generation. It just wiped out the young men of an entire generation throughout much of the world and to this day, a hundred years later, nobody knows why that war was even fought. And, and let me qualify that. People who understand history and they've really studied it, you know exactly why the war happened. But from an ordinary daily look at World War I, there's no earthly reason why that war should have been fought. There was no point to it. After all that fighting, after all those years and all those people dying, an entire generation dying, I'm not aware of one country that gained a single square inch of land from that. They started out, they ended up exactly where they started after all that death and destruction. In that trench warfare is the first time in history that we'd really had trench warfare. So they dig a trench, they sit in there, they lob bombs and artillery back and forth and just kill each other. You're in, and every once in a while you'll make a run for the other trench and probably get slaughtered. You, you can't do anything. You can't win trench warfare. It's a, it's, a, it's a stalemate unless one side is completely incompetent and unarmed. All Quiet on the Western Front to this day, a hundred years later, to me is probably the most effective anti-war film ever made. The only thing that even comes close to it would be the opening of Saving Private Ryan, you know, Steven Spielberg, where he did a fantastic job of demonstrating what the D-Day invasion was like. And even then, it was a vastly abbreviated version. It seems like that opening scene goes on and on and on and on, but those guys doing the invasion, it took the whole day 
or many, many hours for them to do that. Um, all Quiet on the Western Front, despite being black and white, despite having no real experience of what making a film even is in this world at that time, no special effects to speak of, it is brutal. I mean, it is absolutely shocking, the, the battle scenes, the war scenes in there, to this day. But the real reason I want you to watch All Quiet on the Western Front is this. It's told from the German perspective. Okay, bit of a spoiler here, but it has to be done. At the beginning of the film, you have all these German young people out of high school, and they go to college. Now, what do they tell you when you're going to college, right? The, one of the big lies in our society, but it's not all, it doesn't have to be a lie. And certainly back then, it was not the kind of lie it is today. If you go to college, you have a better opportunity to succeed in life and ha be prosperous, have us, etc., etc., right? So going to college is a good thing. And, of course, back then it was much better than today. Back then they taught you the truth and they taught you reality. They taught you that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And, therefore, you could build an airplane that could fly. Whereas today they teach 2 plus 2 equals 5, which is going to destroy our civilization going forward as young people come out of college believing monumentally stupid things like that. But the people doing that to our kids today are these big, huge brained PhDs, these academics. And you've heard me talk about the cult of academia all the time in these videos. There's a reason for that. Back in World War I, who do you think it was who convinced these kids to give up their college education and this wonderful, prosperous life in this increasingly technological and wonderful world to live in? Who convinced them, since Hitler wasn't around yet, who convinced all these young people to go out there and lay your lives on the line for nothing? So your country could just kill off a generation and not even gain anything from it lose everything in fact. Who was it who taught those kids to do that? It was the college professors. It was the big brained academics, the PhDs, the experts, the people who teach your children. The cult of academia has been around for a long, long time, folks. It has been around for centuries, not just decades. This stuff goes back to Copernicus and Kepler and Isaac Newton. In many ways, it goes back to Plato's Academy. These academics are the ones who brainwashed, took these impressionable young people who were on their, they were on the fast track to a great and wonderful life, building a great and wonderful world. And it's these big brain morons, these PhDs, who taught these kids, no, you need to leave this place and go out there and fight this war for the motherland. I'll just leave it at that for now. All Quiet on the Western Front, a film that you really need to see from start to finish, if, if you can handle it. It's that visceral in its brutality. Which brings us to number five. Number five actually is not a film, uh, it's any Lone Ranger episode. When I was growing up, remember I said about existential threats to America, um, one of those threats is the end of heroes. When I was growing up, I had heroes. We had the golden age of Hollywood with dignified, intelligent, classy human beings in Hollywood, celebrities, not the trash we have today, the uneducated, moronic, just trashy looking people who have no dignity at all out there. We had the Cary Grants, and you can, you can argue about who they were off camera all you want, it doesn't matter, that's not even the point. Everybody in society is someone different in public than they are on camera, it's just the way it is. But the fact is, they knew how to carry themselves with the dignity of a diplomat. Diplomats are the same way. They're different people. You know, whatever context you're in, you're a different person. Well, the Cary Grants and the, um, I mean, all the stars, all the celebrities and everything growing up, they showed you dignity. Like when I watched the uh, Dean Martin roasts in the 70s, 
and all these, you know, Don Rickles would come up there and he would roast Frank Sinatra. And they're just all, they're so well spoken. They know about history. They understand American history. Everything that comes out of their mouth is intelligent. And they're, they're just, they're just unbelievable. And these are people who rose from nothing to where they were. But among that, you had other heroes, um, again, who may not have been the best people in the world off camera, but it isn't the point. The point is, what are you seeing and what did they serve as a role model for all the people seeing them, especially the young people? Well, I had people like Evil Knievel. Evil Knievel was, from what I can tell, kind of a jerk, a real jerk. But I didn't know that when I was a kid. All I knew was here was a guy who did not live his life in fear. And he would always say things. He would tell kids, don't do drugs. I couldn't do what I'm doing if I was on drugs. And he did good and wonderful things for young people as a role model. But another one was the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger series, on TV anyway, was out in the 50s, after the radio of the 40s, with Clayton Moore, mainly the, the one I liked the best. Clayton Moore was usually the Lone Ranger. And even as late as, you know, the 80s, I think, or certainly the early 80s, Clayton Moore would still go around, you know, radio stations doing his Lone Ranger thing. He loved it. And uh, God bless him for it. He did such a wonderful thing for the country. But the Lone Ranger episodes, it would have these westerns, um, you know, there's a robber does this, or somebody's trying to steal your land or your cattle. And at the end of it, the Lone Ranger would say something that would present a moral and it's not in a preachy sense or anything, it's weaved very well into the context of the story. He just says it, and it's over. That brings a conclusion to the to the episode, and it's done. So it never seemed preachy or anything like that, but he, everyone would talk about, you know, the idea of virtues, something that I was taught as a child. It goes back to Plato's Academy. Plato, he talked about the virtues all the time. You know, all the, all the great virtues, you know, the patience, and just all the... The Lone Ranger would bring those to your attention in a very subtle manner, not a preachy manner. So maybe the value of one of the amendments to the Constitution or something like that. So as you're watching The Lone Ranger week after week after week, like I did when I was a kid, every Saturday morning I'd watch The Lone Ranger and, uh, well... Bozo the Clown, but uh, that was a local thing, okay? That was, that was a local thing. And, um, and I was young, by the, just for the record. Um, the Lone Ranger had such a good impact on me because without even really realizing it, he would be exposing me to a virtue this time. He'd be exposing me to uh, something about our American history. He'd be exposing uh, uh, the episodes in there talk about how bad racism is. I mean, just all, all these good things that you should know, but without preaching. It was wonderful. He was a role model. He didn't take the whole world on his shoulders. The Lone Ranger show is going to raise our children for us. He just played his small role in there. He was one of the small things that I saw in my life that helped make me into somebody who tries to be virtuous, who views racism as an obscenity, not Black Lives Matter kind of nonsense where they have nothing to do with racism. They could care less about it. I mean, their leaders are out there buying multi-million dollar homes right now with all the money they made last year. They don't care if black people live or die. They never did, if you haven't figured that out yet. But the people who wrote The Lone Ranger back in the 50s did care. And I'm so grateful I grew up with that. Please, go on YouTube and just pick Lone Ranger episodes at random and watch a couple. And see what you think. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And I think it's a crying shame that young people, instead of having that influence on life, what do they get? They get some puppet that tries to tell a little boy watching this show that he might be a little girl. Number six, Beckett. Beckett from 1964. One of the best films ever made, period, in my humble opinion. Can't argue with the cast. You've got Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole in the starring roles. This is a fictionalized account of the relationship, the friendship between 
King Henry II of England and his friend Thomas Becket. Now, Thomas Becket was part of the rabble. You know, he, he was part of, he was like from the wrong side of the tracks, you might say. King Henry was born into royalty. He's one of those guys who came out with a crown on his head from the womb. His poor mother, I repeat again. And um, he was a irresponsible party animal, King Henry II. But he became friends with, just because he appreciated the intelligence and personality, and they got along well together, Becket and King Henry II. And they became extraordinarily good friends and companions, and uh, Becket basically was one of his top men. You know, kind of like, um, you know, with the biblical uh, Pharaoh, with Pharaoh, um, Joseph for various reasons, rises to the top and becomes essentially second in command of Egypt, even though he was not from Egypt. He was a prisoner in Egypt. Uh, same thing with Daniel in uh, Babylon. You know, rose from... That's kind of what happened with, with Becket and Henry II. But because Henry was a megalomaniac who wanted to control everything, and he was irresponsible, immature party animal, you know, he, wanted, he did not want the church having control over him. And the way he tried to fix that was to install his friend Becket as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, the Archbishop of Canterbury, you might think of as the Pope of England. It's not exactly right, but you can think of it that way. He's the religious leader in England. Well, if you put your man in that position, the church is no longer a threat to you, right? The problem that was unforeseen here is that Becket was a better man than Henry II thought he was. When he took on that role, he suddenly realized the responsibility he had. Much like many of our presidents have reported that even after they ran for office, they run for election, they, they win the election, once they enter the White House and they enter and they realize this is my house, this is my office, and they look at those pictures on the wall of their predecessors, it suddenly strikes them, holy cow, I have a solemn responsibility to the American people. And I think we saw that with our previous president, this guy from the Banana Republic who's occupying the White House right now doesn't seem to have any concept of that. But that's what happened with Beckett. He realized, this job, I have the responsibility of serving God. The honor of God is now more important to me than the honor of this random Yahoo who just happens to be the king because he was the one born to the queen. And that says something about government right there. That's the first reason I want you to watch Beckett. It tells you a lot about what government is. It's a bunch of random Yahoos. Government does not descend from the clouds with trumpets, you know, and this this thing that's going to make your life perfect and protect you and make everything good for everybody just being sent to us from God. If you have a kingdom or a dictatorship, it's just some random yahoo who happens to be in charge, and he puts a bunch of other random yahoos in offices. In a country like ours, the beauty of America was that we had a bunch of random yahoos who could run for office, but they actually had to demonstrate some kind of competence, or at least, you know, at least in terms of campaigning. They get elected, but if they're no good, you can get rid of them in two years, or four years, or six years. And it was our responsibility as we the people to take that role seriously. And if we did so, then if someone came along and they did a crappy job, you know, for example, oh, I don't know, Nancy Pelosi, who's been in office now for, I think, what, a hundred years, maybe, something like that. Um, her first week in office demonstrated her utter incompetence and her rancidness, and yet nobody ever got rid of her over those hundred years or however long she's been there. The same for Chuck Schumer. And, and Republican leaders as well, a lot of these fake Republicans. It isn't about Democrat or Republican. It's about these career politicians who don't care anything about you. Look at the videos I made about this Angie Craig, this, this ridiculous clown they've got in Minnesota 
who, when I went to her for help as a constituent, which a responsible person is supposed to help me, instead completely ignored me and is still to this day sending me emails every day asking me to help her. See, these people need to be gone. So one reason to watch Beckett is to think very long and hard about what is government. Government is a bunch of random yahoos. And if you put your faith in government, you're putting your faith in the moron who just cut you off in traffic and put your entire family's life at risk. You're, you're trusting the fool over there who is, um, you know, over there at the grocery store and he's hiding behind there doing something with that banana, but you can't quite see what he's doing with it. That's your government. You, you've got the guys populating the prison over there. Some of those guys come in and out and then that's your government. Your government is every person you've encountered in your life. Some of them are very good and ethical and moral. Others are a moral cesspool. They are born of Satan and everything in between. There's some people who are brilliant, bright-minded, curious, intellectually curious people. And then there's the stupidest. There's people who are so stupid that it's hard to classify them as a human being and everything in between. That's government. It's a bunch of random yahoos. And if you're going to put your faith in that, you're going to find things aren't quite going very well for your society anymore. Which is why the United States of America was the first and really the only nation that had its constitution designed to fix that problem. But our generation let it go. The other reason to watch Beckett is what I said before. Notice how Beckett, based on the context of where he was at, he was willing to change everything about himself almost like that. He was the king's best friend. He was the king's man. He didn't want this job. He, he knew there was going to be trouble with it. But he did what the king told him, and he became the Archbishop of Canterbury. But as he was there, he realized... I am the representative of God now. I used to be the representative of the king. But God is higher than the king. God is the creator of all things. The one true God. This guy is just a random putz. And it ripped apart their friendship. Beckett had to make a choice. Who am I going to serve? Kind of like the Bible says. You can't have two masters. Who are you going to serve? Money or God? Beckett is a wonderful, wonderful story. Again, it's fictionalized. Um, it, it's not based on the real relationship between these two, but the story in the film is, is fantastic. And again, Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole, I mean, wow, in terms of acting. Film number seven is Beer from 1985. Beer. This had uh, Loretta Swit and Rip, uh, I think it was Rip Torn, right? Let me see here. There's a couple Rips back then. Ah, I didn't put it in here, did I? I think it was Rip Torn. Um, it's basically a kind of a, a goofy, almost slapstick comedy. Not quite slapstick, but very goofy comedy about the manipulative power of marketing and advertising. And on the surface, that's what it's about. And the truth is, the film actually does a really good job of showing you some of the specific techniques that marketers and advertisers really do use to manipulate you. But the whole film, through and through, has all kinds of these wonderful little tidbits about how gullible the masses are. I remember back to mass hysteria? If you want to, if you're someone who has control over the mass media, you can create mass hysteria. You can do it. All you have to do is put up a body count, even if there's no real bodies, and people will go crazy enough to stick underwear on their face. Or at least people who don't think about what they're doing. People will even go out and have some toxic concoction injected into their bodies that hasn't been tested by the representatives of a government that has a long history of doing human experimentation without the subject's knowledge. 
and have been sued repeatedly for doing that. Even as people are taking this injection and then when they're perfectly healthy and then just dying within a few days. Even at, uh, the news media report doesn't report that of course, but that's what's happening. Well, if you want to know how it's possible for something like that to happen, Beer is a good way to learn how in a fun way. It's a very funny film. It's it's silly. It's so silly that it's almost deceptively silly. It almost seems like, well, this is just this is just outrageous. This is too easy. You know, it's it's not as simple as all that. It's like, well, it actually is. If you own the airwaves, you don't even have to be good at what you do. These guys were pretty good. But you don't even have to be good. Look at what happened in the last year. The mass media was utterly incompetent. I mean, they, they got busted left and right for telling lies, for spreading untruths, for manipulating people, for showing bias, you know, against Donald Trump, showing, making sure all those doctors, all those leading, respectable, very highly credentialed doctors who came out and said that everything we're thinking about coronavirus is wrong that everything we're doing about it is wrong and dangerous and it's probably going to end up killing more people than that virus ever could and the media just censors them make sure that they're never heard from ever again and the masses are too lazy to go out and research it for themselves so that they will know what these doctors had to say or, or didn't you know that that was happening all this time are you just reading the Star Tribune in, in, <laughs> in Minnesota <laughs> yeah yeah, it really is that easy to manipulate people. I won't go into why right now. There might be an opportunity a little later to do that. <sighs> um, but Beer is a really funny and fun film. It's just a good film to watch. You know, 1980s, definitely a 1980s film. Um, it's hard to explain. It's as if they took... It's as if they were trying to make a parody to teach you about this, but it was so silly that what they're trying to make a parody of is just so ridiculous you don't even know how to make a parody of it because the reality is a joke. And if you look at what's happened with this coronavirus health scare and how easy it was for these people to drum this thing up and keep it going, it is ridiculous. It's, it's lunacy. If you know anything about how they did it and why they did it and who did it, you know, if you're one of the people who actually knows these things, you look back and you think, well, how do you make a parody of this? It's a parody of itself. The, the idea that anybody fell for this scam is, is, is crazy enough. How do you make a joke out of it? And that's kind of what beer is like. It's like marketing and advertising is so overtly manipulative, it almost seems like, you know what I mean? It almost seems like, well, how do you make fun of it when it makes fun of itself? It's just so stupid. But Beer does a great job with it. It's a very entertaining film. And like, like the, uh, the guy who makes the commercials in there says, you know, there's, well, I don't, at the time, I think he said, there's 150 million Americans out there waiting to have their minds bent and twisted. And if I can't do it, nobody can. You know, and, and he's right. He's absolutely right. And it's not because they're marketing or advertisers, it's because they control the broadcast media. And someday i got to talk to you about broadcast media. Alright, that's number seven, Beer, 1985. Number eight is Blazing Saddles. The Mel Brooks film from 1974, Blazing Saddles. Now... Why would I have this one in here to show how and why the world went insane? Well, 1974. If you, have you, if, I'm assuming you've seen Blazing Saddles. If you haven't, you may not know what I'm talking about. Let me just put it this way. It is not politically correct at all. Not even close. Someone in 2021 who is woke, you know, politically correct, woke... If, if someone like that existed back in 74, and they wouldn't be allowed to exist, the, the people of 1974 would not allow that kind of idiocy, but if someone like that existed there and they watched Blazing Saddles, their brain would suffer an atomic explosion. It would just, they would, 
it would be like a new sun beginning, just exploding in a supernova right inside their skull. I mean, Blazing Saddles, for, for stupid people, it is going to offend them every which way to Sunday. But back in 1974, people weren't stupid. They still had a reasonably decent education system. And people could just figure out the obvious that, hey, this is humor. So when they say things like the N-word, they didn't, by the way, they didn't say the N-word, they just said nigger. When they say that word, it's part of comedy. You see, they could figure it out because they were smart, whereas people today are really, really stupid. They can't figure out the obvious. Blazing Saddles did more to end racism in America than a thousand BLMs could ever, in fact, well, BLM is totally different. Black Lives Matter isn't about racism, so it actually hurts race relations. It actually causes the problem it claims to fix. So if you had a thousand BLMs, we would be in a thousand times more trouble. So it's not a good analogy, but let's say you had somebody who sincerely was trying to fight against racism, but they're doing it by going out and whining and moaning and just, oh, what you're doing is racist, and how dare you use that word, it's racist, and, and then just, you know, just some sniveling little NPR watching, you know, it, if you take a thousand of those people, they're going to get nothing done. Blazing Saddles got amazing things done. And it did it by being the most racist film you will ever see, probably. But it's a comedy. Everybody could tell it was a joke. It's using humor to show the stupidity of racism. And it did it brilliantly. Now, you know, Cleavon Little in the starring role there as the black sheriff, absolutely brilliant. And, um, I mean, you may not know it, but Richard Pryor was supposed to play that role. He had another commitment, so they brought in Cleavon Little, who just nailed it. And Gene Wilder as his sidekick. Um, just unbelievable. Watch Blazing Saddles, and as you watch it, ask yourself, would I rather have films like this in my life that make me laugh and bust out and they actually do what great literature does. They expose me to eternal truths such as racism is monumentally stupid. Would I rather have that in my life or would I rather have the kind of idiotic movies they're making today? Like the remake of the Dukes of Hazard, where the whole purpose of the movie apparently was so that a bunch of of leftist lunatics could run around throughout the film going, oh my gosh, you've got a confederate flag on your car. What are you, from the Stone Age? <laughs> the film version wasn't as fun as the original television version of the Dukes of Hazard. Blazing Saddles. When you comprehend how offensive Blazing Saddles should have been, but it wasn't, then you're going to understand the power of humor. And these lunatic leftists have destroyed humor. They've taken away humor from our society. You can't go out and be funny in that manner anymore. And yet, it's being funny in that manner is why Blazing Saddles did more to end racism in America than almost everything that's been done against racism since Blazing Saddles. Number nine is the Pixar movie Cars. That's from uh, 2006, I believe. Cars. Now, Cars, uh, more or less just kind of a cute Disney movie, but the thing is, the storyline revolves around Route 66, the end of Route 66. You see, the, the beautiful thing about having traditions and keeping those traditions instead of trying to progress from the traditions, the beauty of them is that it gives you a consistent link between the generations. There, there's this consistency that those statues, even the ones that represent people who might, we now understand, had done some bad things or what have you, or confederate flag or whatever but these traditions keeping them around is what ties us together as a people over time instead of just cutting us chopping us all up into all these distinct groups that have no nothing between no no um uh, what do I think? continuity 
you see these these lunatic leftists want to go up and destroy all of our great traditions they want to destroy our monuments they want to get rid of the confederate flag they want to go in with a butcher knife and just through the timeline of american history and just chop it all up into pieces when instead what i grew up with was a perfect continuity from the ancestors of the american founders all the way up to me personally a perfect continuity these lunatic leftists are out there just just chopping it all up pull down the monuments pull get rid of the flag can't use this word anymore yada 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 well there's another side of that there's also this other meaning of the word progress progress also with these people means things like uh, you know technological progress you might say or basically changing things they call it progress because we've changed it well what if it wasn't broke in the first place when I grew up they said if it ain't broke don't fix it it's worked for me pretty well right route 66 what happened was when the automobile was invented and shortly thereafter we had the great dust bowl and there was this big migration of all these okies and texans from the dust bowl you know area that got devastated to california where they immediately got enslaved by california corporations yeah i mean just for what it's worth literally enslaved by these corporations on the promises that they're going to have this great wonderful life they were lied to um for the first you know, from the time of the country's founding until the automobile was invented was roughly 125 years or so. And it took all that time almost to build, you know, I mean, it took half that time to get the Intercontinental Railroad. And then it was very slow migration of people from the East Coast over to California because it just was difficult to get there. And you had the Indian Wars going on in between. Well, by the time of, you know, before the Great Depression, when automobiles came out, they started building these roads. Now, they weren't the pavement superhighways we have today. They were roads, but you could drive a car on it. And that's why with the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, so many people could get into their jalopies and they could drive through this desert that used to kill everybody who tried to get to California that way. And they could drive through the desert and get to California. And that's why there's so many people, especially in southern and inland California, who are direct descendants of Oklahoma and Texas. Whereas you might think of California as being a bunch of, you know, liberal, you know, from coming out of New York, Massachusetts originally. It's like, no, half of California comes from that area. The, the, the more sane part of California comes from that area. Those are the people who got enslaved by the California corporations. Well... They got there by Route 66, and as the automobile took off and people started driving more and crossing the country more as they could without the need for a railroad, Route 66 came up as one of the main highways across the country. It literally went through the whole country. And it was a beautiful thing. Americans built their own traditions in real time. It included things like these charming gas stations. Just beautiful, charming gas stations, the, the stores, the no-tell motels, the cheap motels. Uh, you know, that's where things like uh, Holiday Inns would have started and things like that. Travel lodges and things. Um, souvenir shops. Um, again, these tourist traps, they had all these different things. Well, I'm trying to remember any of them, but the, uh, I don't know, they you know have giant dinosaur bones or something like that. Route 66 was just, it was an, it was a... Uh, what do you call it? It was a destination of its own. You know, and Route 66 ended at the Santa Monica Pier. Have you ever been to the Santa Monica Pier? That was the end of Route 66. Route 66 was an American tradition built by our recent ancestors in real time. They weren't trying to. They were just, they were taking this newfangled thing, the automobile, and they were making it our own. And it became the American tradition. And it only took about 30 years before progressives said, this isn't good enough for us. We need something better than this. This beautiful, wonderful, charming, fantastic 
charming thing that we're going to pass on to our kids. We need something better than this. We need a flat, paved road that has nothing on it where everyone can drive at such high speeds that they can't even take in the sights around them. We need to get from New York to California in 10 minutes in our car. That's what the progressive people said. So they built the super highways. Now granted, don't get me wrong, we need super highways. But the thing was, they were so dead set on that that they were willing to sacrifice Route 66 in the process. Instead of adding super highways somewhere else, they put the super highways like a quarter of a mile or a half a mile away from Route 66. And can you guess what happened? Route 66 died a very quick death. And everything along Route 66 died a quick death, including all those wonderful traditions that our ancestors were building. The no-tell motels, the souvenir shops, the tourist traps, all these beautiful, wonderful things of Americana were destroyed almost instantly by the superhighway. The movie Cars is lamenting that, and it does it absolutely beautifully. This is what progressives call progress. A smart person who truly cared about progress would have thought it over a bit and said, well, maybe we should put the, high, the superhighways away from Route 66 so that everything along 66, all those towns and everything, don't just die overnight. Maybe we should put them somewhere else, and then we can have Route 66 for those who want it, and we can have the superhighways for people who need it. But that's not how progressives work. With progressives, it's our way or the highway, you might say. Or in their case, it's the highway, and that's all it is. You don't get Route 66, because that represents the wonderful traditions. Sorry, as it gets warmer with summer coming, the camera's going to start overheating, and I'm going to lose it like I did there. But to summarize, what I was saying was that people who view things in terms of progress as being some kind of weird stepping stone to a future that exists only in their imagination instead of as an organic way of addressing real problems that exist today and finding good solutions that take us forward while maintaining the wonderful traditions that keep that continuity of a people from start to finish you know, like the Jews, the, the, the beautiful thing about the Jews is that from the very beginning, going back to Abraham, they kept their genealogies. So at any time, at least until the, the dispersion, you know, 70 AD, until the Jews were dispersed around the earth, every Jew knew who their ancestors were. They knew I was a direct descendant of David. I was a direct, they didn't need heritage.com. They didn't need to submit a DNA sample to the government which is essentially what you're doing if you send it to these private places. You, they just knew, they maintained this continuity. I'm a descendant of Aaron. Okay, the, the Jews knew that, and there's a beauty to that. It gives them a sense of place and purpose in the continuity of time from, from the beginning to the end. And Americana gave us some of that. These were things that our grandfathers built. They're the ones who designed those cute little gas stations. The first gas stations where these newfangled cars would come in and get gas. They're the ones who designed it. And they came up with these cute, clever designs instead of just making it boxy and functional. That they, they, They're like works of art. The idea of a tourist trap. Well, how do you have a tourist trap if you don't have people touring? The, previously, the only way you could tour was to get on a cruise ship or take a train, maybe. Now you had airplanes, and particularly you had the automobile, and you had people owning their own automobiles. The idea of a tourist trap was a new thing. Our ancestors were inventing what is a tourist trap. But these progressives came along and just said, we don't care what you want, we don't care what you've developed, we don't care about maintaining the continuity of that going forward through your descendants so that they feel directly attached to their own ancestors. We're just coming in and we're going to build a paved road that kills everything your ancestors did and now people are just going to go the way we want them to go, which is as fast as possible down a road that has nothing worth looking at for 3,000 miles. 
And that is how progressives are, folks. It's all about me, 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 what I want, what I, 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 I want. Forget what you want, because you don't matter. It's all about me, 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 me. And if I believe that 2 plus 2 equals 5, then dang it, 2 plus 2 is going to equal 5 come hell or high water. I'm going to make sure of it. If I have to yell and scream and kick like a child, 2 plus 2 is going to equal 5. And some sterile concrete superhighway is going to take precedence over something that is much more slower paced, charming, and gives meaning to our lives. That's what the movie Cars was about. And if you wonder why I would bring it up other than Route 66 and the charm of Route 66, we have other traditions in this country, such as it is absolutely impossible constitutionally, it is impossible for the government, for example, to mandate that you wear underwear on your face. It's not a power of government. It is not, it is not even remotely implied in any founding document that the government should have the ability to micromanage what kind of apparel you wear and where you wear it on your body. That is, that is the kind of thing that dictators of the past, I, I'm not really aware of them ever going that far. Uh, well, that's not entirely true. Hitler did force Jews to wear the, 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 the star the Star of David, to identify themselves. And in a way, this identifies you as somebody who is compliant and easy to control. So they know that you're not the one they need to worry about. It's the people who are fighting against this they need to worry about. But by wearing this, you're helping to identify them, just like the people who would point out, there's a Jew in there! There's a Jew hiding in there! Our Constitution itself is the grandest tradition of all in America. But it only matters if everybody obeys and respects it. Another great tradition was the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, not the dictatorship, to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God. Indivisible not divide and conquer so we can take control indivisible working together with liberty and justice for all that was a tradition that our ancestors invented and the beautiful continuity that that gave to us is what guaranteed me when i was a young person that i was free i had liberty i had the at least the best chance of justice any group of people have ever had in history I had all these blessings. Blessings, yeah, I mean, it's like the preamble of the Constitution. You know, to ensure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Well, it's not going to guarantee that if you come in with that hatchet, that progressive hatchet, and you just cut it up into pieces. You've got to have the continuity. Curves is a great film, but you have to think about what it really means. There's a reason why traditions develop like that. There's a reason why having the Confederate flag stay right where it should be is important to us today. There's a reason why. The only people who are offended by that are people who are easily offended. And those people are destroyers. Just like they destroyed Route 66.